Uh, good evening. Um, I'm, my name is Eric Wishart. I'm the vice president of the club and I'm a journalist with the AFP News Agency. And it's my pleasure tonight to introduce you to a very special guest, uh, Matt Murray, the editor in chief of the Wall Street Journal, and uh, moderator tonight, the club president and senior correspondent at Bloomberg. And those of you who watch Bloomberg TV, she's a very familiar face, Judy Schneider. So, um, Matt, I think you're not too jet lagged. I think you've been here a few days, but um, Matt's been the editor for just over a year, I think. And I think he set some kind of a record because not many editors take over and almost immediately their publication wins the Pulitzer Prize. So that's quite an impressive uh, start to your time in charge. Uh, Matt joined the journal in 94, rose up through the ranks, reporting and editing and is now the, the top editorial chief in, a, in, in an extremely successful newspaper worldwide. It's one of the highest circulation newspapers in America and probably around the world, both digitally and also very interestingly, the, your print circulation is, is, is done, is, continues to do very well, which when you look at the, the, the doom and gloom from other uh, media, publishers, it's, it's quite a remarkable success story, so we're looking forward to hearing um, about that. And um, just before we start the conversation, Jody and Matt will have a conversation and then we'll open it up to questions from the floor. Um, obviously, please switch off your mobile phones if possible. Um, we're going to live stream it, Sarah, I think. Um, I'd just like to say a few words about the protests, and um, Matt, did, you have got your gas mask, right? You, got, you brought it? Right. He's, he's promising to do a story when he goes back. He's been here, you know, like everybody does. But, no, it's a very difficult situation for journalists in Hong Kong. I mean, this is a peaceful city, and I don't think we've seen violence like this for 50 years. And so the club has been very active, and I would say on three fronts, we... Um, we're very active without overdoing it on statements, like when people are arrested or if media are attacked, um, we issue statements. Uh, we met the police quite recently to try and improve relations between journalists and uh, the media, which is, I don't know, with mixed success if you look at what happened recently. And also we've been holding a series of workshops, which we'll continue to do on um, media safety and um, and there's lots of threats there's there's physical threats there's legal threats and all the rest of it and um, i don't want to embarrass you steve -o, but um, <laughs> hats off to steve -o Stephen, who's the wall street journal's uh, security manager for asia pacific who's been a huge supporter of a club he joined a panel i did at the journalism conference on journalist safety he did a he 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 was the speaker in the first workshop we did on physical safety, and he was back on again a couple of weeks ago with Sharon Fast from Hong Kong University, who advises us on the, the, on the legal risks. And it was quite, um, quite sobering, actually, how the situation on the ground had changed. Um, um, it was kind of funny, but it wasn't funny. I mean, Steve said, you have to bring pajamas now to the protest because if you get hit by these water cannon with the blue dye and the pepper spray, spray mixed in, you've got to get clothes off and changed. And this really has a resonance. We, we post it online and, um, and in, a, in an environment where people don't really have a culture of, of hostile environment training, it's been very useful. So I would like to thank you, thank the Wall Street Journal for support you've given us and all the other media and, and thanks again for your expertise Steve. -o. So without any further ado that's enough from me. Uh, Jody, thank you. <laughs> thanks Eric. Well and thank you Matt for coming. A little jet lagged yeah. but uh, we appreciate it. So let's start by talking about your career at the Wall Street Journal. Um, quite a career. So many of us move around so much but you've been there for, what, two and a half decades? Um, national editor, deputy managing editor, deputy editor in chief. So tell us, what about newspapering, uh, especially in the digital age, uh, has kept you there? Uh, well, first, I want to thank everybody for having me here tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. 
for me and to see some familiar faces, which is going to keep me honest in telling some of the stories, former colleagues and some of our current staff. Uh, and particularly, as Eric said, at a time when I know um, being a journalist in Hong Kong has uh, been a very stressful uh, uh, profession. And, and there's a lot of people here doing, I know, uh, important and difficult work uh, every day. But also, whether you're, in, whether you're out covering the stories or just keeping your news organizations going, I know it's a challenge. And I'm just glad to be here and, 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 uh, and uh, see you tonight. Um, and uh, so thanks for having me. Um, uh, I think I've been at the Journal for 25 years in part because I never got a job anywhere else. Um, uh, and I, 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 that's only kind of half kidding because it's been sort of a roller coaster ride at different periods of the Journal. But once I got in there, the way that the Journal approached storytelling, the way that uh, uh, the writing was so central to the journal, but also uh, never thinking I would like doing business journalism ever. And in fact, one of my classmates left college when I graduated in 1987, and he went right to the journal. And I remember thinking, man, that seems really boring. Um, I loved discovering that business opened a whole world of storytelling and a whole way to view the world that was unique in journalism and not very widely covered terrain. I mean, you probably had the same experience, Jody, where you just find your way into all kinds of stories that lie at the center of, of all kinds of things, you know? I mean, big stories are happening in the U.S. right now and our sphere tied back to SoftBank. Journalists don't understand SoftBank. A lot of the China story and disruption is with technology and money and trade, and it's a great lens on it. So I've been fortunate enough to stay there through, those, through all those times, and, and I think we're doing very well now. It's still very strong today. So your newspaper, as Eric noted, won the Pulitzer Prize for national reporting, a very prestigious Pulitzer, uh, for uncovering hush money payments to women who said they'd had fares with uh, President Trump. Um, tell us how your newspaper went after that. And also, is winning a Pulitzer as big a deal as it used to be? What, what does it do for the staff? Some people think it stopped, stopped being a big deal when we won one. I don't know, so I can't speak to that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, look, it's all, it's all credit to the reporters, you know, and, and a, a lot of the work preceded my uh, becoming the editor. You know, so uh, I have to give credit to our investigative team and the reporters especially who did it. But the truth is it was classic follow-the-money reporting, classic digging, um, going back to the very beginning of the first story they did in 2016 when they got onto these what now famous catch-and-kill payments that the National Enquirer would do of buying stories for people who had scandals to tell and then putting them under lock and key. And we had a couple of reporters, particularly uh, the two lead reporters, who, who for more than a year spent time stalking the lawyers and the money keepers around that story to try to get deeper as to what was going on and uncover it. And they finally broke through and got the story of Stormy Daniels, which was almost initially such an outlandish and tabloidish story. It seemed like a strange thing to run in the Wall Street Journal. but. It is, a, it is a follow the money story. It was payments and payoffs and understanding lawyers and finances. And, and that was the, that, that, that big story on, on uh, Stormy that we did early in, in uh, last year was the one that, that broke it open and it just went from there. Um, you know, <clears throat> the job of somebody like me, uh, I was deputy editor when that story broke and then I became the editor is essentially to um, encourage them to keep going and stay out of the way. Uh, and we had a great team doing it. So, uh, and every time they wrote a story, we just told them, put everything you've got, don't leave anything left, put it all out there. And so they had to write the stories and then start from scratch the next time and keep going. So it was all credit to them, really. But it was a nice, it was a, it's a nice honor for us. And I think we are still, well, we'll see how this impeachment thing goes. But to, to, to this point in time, we are, um, I think, stand out on those stories for those work those reporters did at implicating the president directly in the commission of a crime, which I think was not what we set out to do, but was a consequence of the story. So I'm proud of the work they did. Well, speaking of President Trump, as you knew we would. <laughs> Please, I love talking about it. Um, and the press. Um, so he doesn't call the Wall Street Journal, as, as I recall, you don't get called the fake Wall Street Journal very much, like the fake New York Times uh, in the Washington Post. but. How has covering Washington changed in the Trump era? Uh, your predecessor as editor had been criticized 
for some for softening coverage, and others said that the journal's approach has been more than fair, more fair than its rivals. So, you know, how, how has this, um, uh, yeah, we've, how has we've, this changed? We've, we've had a couple run-ins uh, with the president that's not nearly on the level of our competitors. I mean, in the case of the New York Times, I have to say, I wish we got some of the abuse that, that they get, because even though I think it's a strain for them, it reflects this kind of like secret love he has for them. Like they're the, I mean, he's the outer borough kid and they're the midtown princess that he just would love to date, but they're too good for him. Uh, I wish he had felt that way always about us. Uh, there's like, it's kind of a passionate thing he's got going on there. Um, I mean, you know, you, you, you know Washington better than I do, Jody, and some of you were there, uh, have, have, have been there, I'm sure. It's tough, it's gotten a lot more difficult. And the president is a big part of it, but he's not the only part of it. Um, because he's also, he, he's both a product of changing rules and then an enabler of further changing the rules. So you're living in a very hot house environment that's extremely partisan, extremely divided, where everybody is playing an angle. And in the middle of it, you've got this, uh, this bizarre figure who will say anything and do anything and who constantly, not only attacks the press, but also likes to draw us in to be players on the field against him and then use that against us. Uh, he has un uncovered one of the secrets of the press, which is uh, whatever his popular popularity rating is, we are less popular. And he uses it to bludgeon us regularly and to sort of try to bring us down to his level and argue with him all the time which is a challenge for our role, which is really not to be, in my view, players on the field, but to be neutral arbiters writing about the players on the field. And he actually, Donald Trump deserves credit for a couple things that we don't give, give to him. One is he probably understands the psychology of the press about as well as any president ever has in terms of things that will write in our vanity or other things that will appeal. And secondly, he, in a perverse way, knows how to play to us very well. I mean, he will literally, you talk to our reporters in there, he literally will go out and trash publications, and then he talks to reporters more than any president any of them can remember. He knows their names, he knows their stories, he's up on them, he really knows how to work the system. Um, obviously, it's corrosive and damaging and potentially risky for the press when the president is... Uh, attacking you regularly from the pulpit, and others are learning bad habits. So new habits are taking place that make being a journalist there harder. So it's become more common, I think, for instance, for public officials to say things on background or off the record, and then once they're published, if the president doesn't like them, to deny that they ever said them and to attack the press for publishing them, things they were told by these same people as sources. Um, and other politicians, as we see, are learning the same habits. It's no longer the case of, um, if, of uh, as simple as uh, saying something that you shouldn't say or having a story that you don't like and sort of distancing yourself or downplay it, people just lie and attack the press. Those habits, I fear, are with us now for a while and here to say, oh, there you go, Carlos. And, uh, and that's, that's bad for us. I, I, so it's, it's, it's worrisome and difficult in all sorts of ways. Uh, one thing I also, I also should add, too, because it came up, the other thing is that in, in this sort of politicized uh, troll army that you've got now in the social media world, Jur being a journalist in Washington is extraordinarily high stress. I'm sure some of you have had similar experiences here these days, but you know, you're know you routinely gonna be attacked for any story. Readers will come at you, trolls will come at you, social media will come at you. It's just a hothouse environment that's difficult. Well, let's talk a little bit about digital transformation. Uh, the newspaper industry has been transforming itself throughout its history, um, obviously, but perhaps more, much more so in the last few years. Um, so at last count, you have 2.6 million uh, print and online subscribers. Tell us about uh, how that works in terms of navigating the transformation and also where you see this going. Well, uh, you said it. We've been navigating it fitfully for, I don't know, 15 years or so in different ways. I mean, really, for the journal, Starting in 19, I think we, in 1996, we started our website with a paywall, but it was <clears throat> literally in a different floor and kind of segregated from the rest of the newsroom until 2007 or so. Um, so, uh, you know, I really think of the last 12 or 15 years as the, as the real period. But, I mean, it's, it's things, other than Bloomberg, it's things lots of people here have lived with, of, 
of, of experimentation and restructuring and trying things to make it better and sometimes failing and sometimes having to reset and try to affect a culture and mindset change of what the digital needs are first. We're writing more stories. We write over 200 stories a day now. When I was a reporter who joined the paper, you know, we did the one product every day and it was a certain number of stories to fill it up. Getting us to be more visual. The Wall Street Journal, I don't think, published its first photograph until late 2008, except maybe for 9-11, I think we published a photograph. But we had you know, a tiny art department, tiny graphics department. We weren't thinking visually all the things that mean success of the digital age. And now it's about affecting a real culture mindset and keeping the print paper strong, but getting people to think about digital imperatives. So stop arguing about story length and start thinking about engagement for your audience. Um, think about how you deliver visuals and video at the front end, changing our publishing schedule entirely. Uh, 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 two years ago, still two years ago, the number one time of day for publishing stories at the Wall Street Journal was 7 to 8 p.m., because that's when our early edition closes. Digitally, it happens to be one of the lowest uh, uh, readership times of the day. So changing our whole schedule and news process to publish most of our stories at 6 o'clock in the morning, all those kinds of things. Um, and, you know, we are not where we should be, but we keep pushing it. So, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about China and the U.S. Uh, coverage of the trade war in Hong Kong has obviously occupied a lot of um, your staff's time out here in, in recent months. Um, first of all, how do you see this coverage evolving? And also, is there a burnout fatigue factor, uh, both for your journalists and perhaps for your readers? Uh, yeah, uh, depends on who the reader is, I suppose. <laughs> um, I think it's a whiplash factor for our readers reading about the trade coverage. Um, well, trade, uh, first on trade, it's obviously a pretty important story for, for, the, for the Wall Street Journal to, to be very involved in the trade talks, as it is for Bloomberg when you've got sort of that finance lens. Um, it, it's one we just felt we had to be in the middle of and had to commit to. We've got a great team that's really well sourced and in the middle of it. Um, and it's been an important story for us uh, throughout. We've broken some big stories. You know, I think that economic lens, I, I really do believe broadly journalism, uh, you know, I, I, I tell our staff and I really feel this strongly, so hopefully I'm not saying the wrong thing, but a lot of journalism is, a, is sort of political and built around politics and general news, and that's good and that's important, but I don't think that there's enough business economic of a mindset in journalism in many corners, and that's really what's driving a lot of the stories and a lot of the issues, how strong is the Chinese economy, and that's really at the heart of trade, and so it's an important story for us where we want to bring a unique lens. So we've pushed everybody, uh, as you're suggesting, to cover it aggressively and try to cover it in all its effects, and I think they've done great work, our team. It, it is exhausting. Um, and in general, China's been important to us since we opened our first uh, our bureau for the first time there in 1980. Um, and we have prided ourselves for a long time on trying to get into the economic stories and make sure that's, that's covered pretty closely. Um, I wish I could tell you where it's going. We'd all like to know. But my, if I had to guess, my gut is whatever happens here with a phase one or phase two, the U.S. and China have embarked now on for the foreseeable future and you know, probably a decade or more, a, a series of painful negotiations and litigations about the nature of our relationship and how it will evolve. And there'll be more and more of these kinds of tense moments and getting closer together and relitigating things. And how it ends up, I don't know. I, I doubt there'll be a total decoupling, but it could happen, I suppose. But it's, it's, an, it's been an important. In terms of burnout of the staff, I don't know. They're here. They got dragged out to see the editor talk, which is pretty torturous. Um, it's exhausting. Hong Kong has added a lot to it. I'm sure everybody in this room feels it. You work all week and big protests happen on the weekend and you're out there and it's stressful. So I think I do worry about burnout for the staff and uh, exhaustion. I think that's a real concern and we're trying to do what we can to make sure people get time off and cycle them out. We brought in some editors and folks to help spell them, but it's, it's difficult. I'm sure everybody feels it. To switch gears a little, uh, you've written two books. I'm fascinated by one of them, The Father and the Son, an autobiographical account of your father's decision in middle age to become a Benedictine monk. 
First of all, did your family like the book? <laughs> did they buy it? My dad, my dad said to me once after it was published, yeah. it was accurate mostly. <laughs> Not really what you want to hear. So what was that like, you know, writing about your own family and, uh, and why did you decide to do it? Uh, <clears throat> well, I just felt, I guess really it's actually pretty simple. I wish I could say I had a profound revelatory moment, but I was at the journal as a fairly new reporter. The journal has a pretty good, strong tradition of uh, certain kinds of deep narrative uh, nonfiction, and I thought I had a great story to tell that I was interested in telling, and along with that, exploring it. So um, I, I think that I got, got the opportunity to do it at the journal and decided I would, I would do it. And not, in hindsight, without a certain kind of mixed outcome. It's a strange thing to write about your family and turn them into a story. So. I think that had a strange effect on, on my family and, and siblings a little bit. Um, but in the end, it became a great opportunity to explore and learn about my family history and get to talk to my father about this rather dramatic decision he made over time. Uh, he, my, my mother had passed away, by the way. He was a widower. He didn't leave my mother to go do this. I don't, that still not, wasn't allowed. But, he, uh, but, but it, was, it, was, it, was, it turned out to be a positive experience for me in understanding my family and myself better. Well, before we go to Q&A, and I'm sure we'll have lots of questions, um, what do you think that in coming years the mix of skills will be for those who want to succeed you, who want your job? Uh, will it be technology as well as management and journalism? It's a good question. <clears throat> um, you know, I think that, I think that my job is, well, it's interesting. Um, one thing about my job, as long as Rupert Murdoch uh, is the, 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 owns the Wall Street Journal, and this is really true, and I've seen it up close, my job has to be journalistic at the heart of it. He doesn't want an editor who's a bureaucrat or who's too removed from the news. So the first part is to be on news and understand the stories and have, a, have some breadth across the news. Um, that's only one part of it. I think these jobs, all these jobs like mine, are getting more and more strategic because the world of journalism is going to continue to evolve. In many ways, our pay model is in serious uh, danger and new ways of making uh, money or keeping the, the journalistic uh, uh, tradition alive uh, have yet to be discovered and are evolving. So people need to think strategically to have my job. Understanding technology better than I do is going to become more and more important. Uh, really, you're becoming a techno technological product and how you think about that is, is uh, is becoming pretty key to the job. And of course, there's a managerial part of it as well as cultures evolve and you have to think about big staffs and uh, uh, desires of, of workers and what they want continue to evolve. So there's a lot of aspects to it. Um, and I, you know, right now we have a really great bunch of leaders across the Wall Street Journal, but part of my job, uh, even early on, in my, is, is to get them as much different kinds of experience as they can and have as many people vying to be the next editor as possible. So I think I, we're no longer in the era when it's like, uh, and it really for any management job, we're not really in the era anymore where it's like, get the best reporter, put him in the seat, let him be the boss. Uh, the skill set today that people need in a modern workplace is pretty demanding. And so being a great journalist is the starting point, but not the only point. Well, now we have time for some questions. There'll be uh, microphones coming around. Please identify yourself and your, um, your affiliation, uh, presuming you have one. Uh, and uh, we will, we'll have time for, for about uh, 15 minutes or so of questions. So who wants to ask the first one? Over here. <laughs> uh, uh, good evening, and thank you for a very interesting Q&A. Um, I'm, I'm very old, as you can see, and uh, I can remember when Republicans... Please tell us who sorry, you are. Sorry, Mike, Mike Rouse, uh, South China Morning Post, RTHK, here or there. Um, I'm very old, and I can remember when Republicans believed in fiscal responsibility. How does the journal feel about trillion-dollar deficits? Well, I should say... Um, uh, I, I, I'm not, I don't want to whiff on the question, but I should say the Wall Street Journal very clearly and explicitly has a very firm line between news and opinion. So I have nothing to do with opinion. 
I shouldn't even really talk about opinion generally uh, as a matter of course. Um, so um, I have nothing to do with our opinion decisions, although as you suggest on the Republican side, the journal uh, opinion pages are pretty much the leading Republican uh, pages in the United States. I can tell you, on the, I, but I can say, having said that, first on the news side, um, it's a big story. We've covered it, you know, given it fairly decent attention, although we, there was one the other week that we kind of underplayed. And I think it's an important issue for us to write about. And our enterprise editor's there, and it's still something we talk about and I harangue him about. And I think generally, I can say on the opinion side, as a reader of the opinion pages, they don't love them and they're a little concerned about them, but they don't let that concern get in the way of their uh, enjoyment of tax cuts. Well put. Uh, other questions? Yeah, Mark. Okay. Mark Michaels and I am Asia. Um, been in Asia for a long time. And the, I want to ask you about some of what you've done in Asia, a little different than some other, some other organizations. With Singapore, highly controversial, one M MDB in Malaysia and so on, you've taken, you've taken very aggressive reporting stands, even when the government has clamped down on you, has put restrictions on you, all sorts of things, where some other organizations, frankly, were, were less, were less uh, enthusiastic about doing that. Is that a philosophy? I mean, because you obviously, you obviously pay a bit of a penalty for that, but at the same time, you know, you're, you're doing a real service, and in one case, I guess you help bring down a government. So, you know, to one extent or another. So, uh, what, what is it, and how, why do you think it's a little, why do you think you approach it differently than some others without criticizing others, but others look more for compromise in some situations, especially in places like Singapore and elsewhere, than they might other places? Well, that's very nice of you to say. I mean, all credit to our staff, really, that did all the work and the leadership here. Uh, throughout 1MDB and, and some of the editors who really drove that were here and I were part of this club and have <clears throat> gone back to the States and so that's very nice of you to, to, to say it to say it that way. I, I guess I just don't think of it that way. You know, I think that I think trying to robustly directly write about events uh, and doing accountability work where we see the opportunity has been part of what we do for a long long time we are actually fortunate in the organization that there's a deep history and tradition that predates me of supporting that kind of work uh, um, and standing up for it. And we're lucky that we're part of a big, well-resourced company that invests in things like lawyers and helps us and stands behind us. And, you know, I mean, I, I'm sympathetic that, that not everybody's in that situation. It's one of the, it's one of the challenges facing the profession today. Uh, it's one of the it's one of the fortunate things for us, or the New York Times, or other or Bloomberg, or other big organizations that that have those moments. I, look, I do think, you know, it's a complicated world, and you have moments uh, when you know you're faced with decisions with governments, and you know sometimes that can, I suppose, say something about the organization. But at, at our organization, we've got a we've got a pretty rich tradition of. Uh, High standards and ethics, and and so it's, it's. I think it's sort of embedded in the culture. You know, if anything, I think early on on one one MB um, one MDB, the thing that stands out to me from the journal's approach is the reporters really brought that in and really found that story and brought it to us, and actually had to persuade us that it was as big a deal as it turned out to be early on because we didn't know. So, if anything, I think, and I have to remind myself of this sometimes because, like every editor, I. I'm a know-it-all who doesn't know as much as I think I do, having a place where you can empower the reporters to bring you stories and stand behind them is important too. Other questions? Um, over here. Yeah. And hello, my name is Rafe Cunningham. I'm a freelance journalist. You mentioned Mr. Murdoch earlier on and um, I know lots of people have very different views about him, but but one thing that he seems to seems to have um, pulled very dear are newspapers and publishing. So, are you worried about what what might come after him? I mean, about the next owner of the journal. 
You know, I'm not very worried about it. I, I mean, our CEO, who's close to him, uh, Robert Thompson, and who was a former editor, is CEO of News Corp, and he's pretty committed to the journal. And I know uh, Lachlan Murdoch, who has uh, taken on a bigger role within his companies, is pretty committed to the Wall Street Journal. So I'm not that worried about it. Um, I'm not sure exactly, uh, I, you know, what 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 processes are happen or when, but I I think. <clears throat> I think it's I think it's in a good place, and I and I don't feel I, I don't have any particular worry about it. I mean, I think my job as editor in chief is to is to help the reporters at the Wall Street Journal and the journalists do the best work they can and keep the publication as strong and relevant and up to date as necessary. And the rest will take care of itself. Okay. Other questions? We have time for just a few more. I, I could be here all night, Joey. <laughs> all right. Been, I don't, I don't have any all right. Good, uh, Jen. Ask a tough one. <laughs> Hi, um, Jennifer Hughes, Reuters, Asia Finance Editor. Um, you know, we talk about the newspaper, we talk about uh, circulation of 2.6 million. Will there be a newspaper itself, a physical product, in, let's say, 10 years' time? Yeah, I, I don't know. We, we wonder about it all the time. I mean, in our, one thing about, one thing about um, uh, Rupert Murdoch is he loves the print paper, and he's, he's, he's helped keep it strong. He hasn't pressured us to really winnow it down for cost savings, but there are pressures on papers. I think some, I think the paper is still, in many ways, the best mechanism for reading the news. It still offers a sense of completeness that digital doesn't. It's it can, it's got an order that digital doesn't. It's an aesthetically pleasing experience, but there's a lot of things that are working against it. One being, of course, the phone and our news addiction habit. There, one is time and the, the, the time to sit down and read the paper and get the ink on your fingers and the other stuff. A big issue in the US is just simply the costs. The costs are quite high. Uh, transporting the paper as a national news organization, one of the hidden factors in newspaper deals like Gannett and Gatehouse is the, the number of places that publish and have the capability to publish become fewer and fewer and fewer. So that gets costlier and more difficult. And you know, we'll see how the habits of the, of the younger readers evolve as they, as they get older. So I, I, you know, what we say, and it's, it's corny, I'm afraid, but <clears throat> it's about the best we can do, is we've got to be a new, an organization committed to bringing people the journal however they want it in the different formats as long as they want to take it that way. So. I, whether uh, one of one of two things is going to happen, print is going to go down to a really boutique product for certain markets where it could be printed in a in in bulk, probably fairly high priced, and there'll be certain you know group of people in New York and San Francisco and D.C. and Chicago who get to who get the newspaper because they prefer that and will pay for it, or it'll go away to altogether. But I think it's probably one of those two things. Um, question over here. Yeah. Oh, no. uh, Shelly. Shelly Banjo Bloomberg, former Wall Street Journal. What's your um, commitment to foreign coverage considering fewer and fewer Americans care about what happens outside of their borders? Fewer. Did they ever care? That's the question. Um, it's pretty important for us at this point. You know, I mean, unfortunately, in the last decade, uh, just in full disclosure, you know, in the last uh, decade, and particularly up until about two and a half years ago, as we went through different ways of growth and cost cuts, our staff went up, but went down. We, cost, we cut jobs overseas at different times. I think we're now at a place where um, we're, we're, we're at baseline. I, hopefully we won't be ever faced with more cost cuts for now, and we'd like to grow it up from there. That's important to say, but you don't, these days in our profession, we don't know. And, but I, I, think we, I think it's at baseline because um, the foreign story remains very important to our readers, and understanding the world is pretty important to the readers of the Wall Street Journal, a lot of whom you know, are in business or politics or government or have high-powered jobs and need that global view and depend on us for that. Um, I also still think uh, foreign stories and foreign coverage still, even in this digital age, even this age of social media connectedness, can bring a magic to journalism that you can't get anywhere else, can take you to different places, give you different experiences, introduce you to different people with a depth and texture that a tweet does not capture. 
Um, so uh, we really value it as part of what we do. We, we are, have really had some tr tremendously uh, potent overseas coverage this year. And not just a business, but the Hong Kong story has been a big one for us, as it has been for all of you in this room. And I, I think, Shelley, you know, knock on wood, I think, uh, if anything, we're, we're in a position where from here we would grow. I don't see us retreating uh, any further on the news front. One last question. Who has some? Yeah, over here. You, Lee. Thank you. Um, my name is Yuli Yang. I work at CNN. Um, I wanted to ask a hypothetical question. If you have, say, all the technology, all the, all the future possible technology at your disposal, artificial intelligence, etc., cetera, um, what do you foresee are the jobs or the parts of the jobs that you will um, delegate to artificial intelligence and with the freed up labor and resources, what would you invest those um, into. So the robots Thanks. job question. Which jobs are where I replace and where would I invest the money at the same time? Is that both? Yeah, basically what do you, obviously I'm sure you, um, we all have our imagination of what artificial intelligence will very soon be able to do. Um, what other jobs within journalism um, you think will be replaced, can, can be replaced, say in five, ten years time? by technology or artificial intelligence and with the freed up um, resources and labor, what would you invest those into instead? Well, I have to say in full disclosure, I wish I, my company uh, was cutting edge enough that these were questions pressing upon us right now. Uh, uh, so I probably haven't given it the thought uh, or gotten the investment that would make us right at the leading edge of it. Um, I, I think that in journalism, you know, certainly as long as I'm around, um, I, I certainly hope and don't and wouldn't foresee a time when artificial intelligence or or a machine uh, uh, machines of various kinds would ever or should ever replace basic journalistic work. And I, I I say that with tremendous belief that as flawed as journalistic work can sometimes be. It's, it's a human activity. It's done by humans. It's not an automated concern. And so I don't really see core journalistic activity, which is a lot of what we do, uh, hopefully being replaced. I, I think what artificial intelligence probably can help us all do <coughs> is really improve our publishing, really improve our fact gathering, really improve our numbers. You know, it would be a great thing at the Wall Street Journal if we had uh, an electronic, fantastic, some of you guys probably have this now, but like a fantastic, much more rigorous uh, database and photos and other kinds of things in libraries and other ways of accessing tools quickly. And you could speak to your computer and have it spit out the right photo right away and give you, you know, we'll probably get to a place where our CMSs will be verbal rather than typing and those kinds of things. So I think a lot of those things maybe will be dictating our stories. I, I can see a world of those tools coming. Whether that frees up money or costs more money is a really good question, because uh, once you start spending on the technology, you'd have to tend to uh, keep doing it. But my hope in, those, in that case always, uh, although I'm sure I'd have interesting conversations with uh, the commercial side of the business uh, and my boss, the CEO of the company, but my hope would always be that those can go into more journalists. You know, I think at, the, at our organization today, and it's part of being digital, We've got a large number of reporters. We could certainly use more engineers. We could certainly use more data people. We could certainly use more graphics people. Um, uh, you know, I, the, the other thing I guess I'd say is, is I'm sure there are some, um, you know, I'm sure there are some tasks that can be done uh, at, a, at a, you know, like basic copy editing that not in the interest of efficiency though, but in the interest of freeing up people to do sort of higher order work. Uh, would be my hope, but I, um, if we're, you know, it, it, it's not something that in, in our case is pressing on us right now or it's right in front of my eyes. I, I think a bigger challenge coming with machines for journalism and for all of us in the next 10 years, we're talking about how long the print paper will be around and we're talking about being fully digital is how will people be experiencing journalism in 10 years, you know? Uh, are we ready? Half of the searches on Google now, half are um, by voice. 
Are we really ready for a world of journalism where voice is more central to everything? Does the phone go away in 10 years and are people getting headlines or news through glasses or through other kinds of devices? I think a big challenge for all of us is to be ready to build for that world wherever the technology takes us next. Um, it's only, it's staggering if you think about the change in our profession and that we've been through in the last 12 years that the iPhone came along 12 years ago. 12 years ago. To think about how that's completely uh, re rearranged journalism, storytelling, how we do things, had dramatic effects on advertising, had dramatic effects throughout our newsrooms. And then, as we were yesterday, some of my colleagues up in Shenzhen to see entire companies, empires built up around the phone, and the phone could be gone in 10 or 15 years. We could be in the age of wearables. We could be getting headlines through helmets. I don't know. That's more of what I think about for the world of journalism of the future is what, how are we built for that world? Well, please join me in thanking uh, Matt Murray for his insights. Thanks for having um, me. It's a pleasure to be here. And we have, we have FCC Gibbs. <laughs> Thank you all.